researcher um, as well as a research, researcher and my background is actually international education. Um, I'm also doing my PhD um, at UCL IOE London and this thing that I'm presenting to you today is part of my current PhD research. So it's actually the first time I'm introducing this to the world. So um, yeah, I'm quite excited. I'll, I'll look forward to some feedback, some questions, some thoughts, some criticisms um, uh, that I can take away from, from, uh, from all of you. Um, what I'm going to present to you today is a bit of an ex a methodological experiment, and it's the result of my own research that I'm doing with a school here in Hong Kong. So um, we kind of came up with this as we went through our research. Now, I'm an, my background is in education, but I think and I hope that everything I'm telling you today or that I'm kind of trying to unpack might also be relevant to your field. So I don't want this to be limited to education. I think it can be um, applied or explored in other fields and other domains, whether it's music or, or cultural studies or sociology. I, I think there's potential. So, so whatever I'm saying about education, think about how this is relevant to your field, how it might be the same or how it might be different. What punk ethnography is will hopefully be um, uh, clear to you uh, in, in 20 minutes time. Um, so my background is in education. Uh, I've been a teacher longer than I've been a researcher. Um, so I've worked across continents in various contexts, um, adult education as well as secondary international uh, context. So when I talk about education, I talk about research as well as practice. And this is one of the first points I'd like to make. I think in other fields as well, there's such a big gap uh, or a void, like a black void between research and practice. And I think that's one of the first things um, that I'm personally trying to bridge is bridging the gap. A lot of research remains in the academic uh, realms in, in very highly specialized journals and don't reach an audience. And there's a lot of practitioner stuff happening out there in the field that is really valuable and doesn't make it into research. So that's kind of the first statement I'm making. And I'm starting from a problem, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on um, um, whining about the problem, but I do wanna uh, state what the problem is, I think. Uh, for me, education is really stuck in a kind of, what I term as the no alternative of what works, uh, whether you're in, Hong Kong or in Indonesia or in Australia or in Germany. Uh, I think a lot of the education practices, research as well as what happens in schools is very much driven by numbers, by tests, competition, um, competition not just for students but also for teachers. So in, in many cases I find speaking to people across continents who work in different contexts as well as my own experience, I think we really have reduced education to something that is instrumental technocratic. Uh, which is a bit part of, um, of a neoliberal wave, I would say. Um, and it's, it's, I think education of all fields is a field where people really want to play it safe. Schools play it safe. They, you know, they are complying uh, with policies. They are trying to keep up reputations. Um, they have to, if it's a state school, they have to obviously deliver the, the, the national curriculum. If it's an international school, international schools do claim that they are more innovative, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of, you know, reach chewing and rechewing of, of the same kind of um, mainly words. Um, so so um, that then is also reflected in research. I think I read, I try to read a lot of papers, I read a lot of research, and this, these are not my words. I took it from a from a, a paper I really like. Um, Gergen, he says, well, research is a lot about mirroring, reflecting, illuminating, kind of recycling what is going on rather than really doing something new. Um, so, so for me, that means we kind of have a crisis. Um, and I think if you look at, I mean, the word crisis is obviously very relevant to, to where we are today in the world, but it's true. I think we do are, we are stuck with a 
with a health crisis, we're stuck with a crisis in education, we're stuck with financial crises, and yet, depending on where you are in the world, but I think globally, we never had so many educated people. There's still people who fall through the mazes of the net, but it's kind of worrying that we, we deal with so many crises and we have so many educated people. So I think there might be a correlation and it's worrying, but for me, crisis also means there's opportunity. If we're stuck with numbers in education, if we're stuck with delivering a kind of education that doesn't really seem to be responding very well to, to what the world needs, then I think we've got an opportunity to do something different. So it's kind of what I'm trying to do in my research and it's what my main narrative is today as well. So, and this is where I draw literature that is also plugging into anarchy uh, and anarchy as a philosophy. I think of all the fields, uh, education um, and schools, um, uh, specific schools can be a field of social change. If we don't allow our, our kids in schools, wherever they are, to, to contribute to social change, well, we can't really expect that to happen in their later lives, that meaning having a drive to, um, to work uh, towards social change. Um, so again, research and practice there, I think, um, need to work together. So teachers and, and researchers have a, an opportunity there to work together. So what I'm arguing for is, well, let's, let's just wipe everything off the table, uh, not by saying it's bad, but looking at is this what we're doing? Does this work for the context? Does it work in Indonesia? Does it work in Hong Kong? What we're doing, is it valuable for the communities we're part of? And if it isn't, well, we have an opportunity to do something different. So to, to create an alternative way of being and therefore also imagining maybe a different future. Um, I like to draw, uh, I'm Belgian uh, by origin. So I, I read a lot of French philosophers uh, as well. So I like the idea of fissures. There's like cracks in the system always, right? We, we talk about education as if it's, as if it's one a uh, very homogeneous um, field, but it's not. There's so many different um, contexts and communities, and these these allow for um, alternative, well, building alternatives, I think, or doing something different in our schools of whatever nature. It could be curriculum, it could be a different way of teaching, it could be bringing in indigenous knowledge, it could be bringing in a different way of looking at uh, content. That's not really um, the focus of the discussion today, but it could be many different things. And I think a good starting point is what constitutes a good life, where we are in our in the context that that uh, we're operating in. And I draw on concepts that are quite yeah, uh, common in punk and anarchistic literature. Um, the whole idea of punk ethnography comes out, a, out of a concern for relationality, for being interconnected and from having um, a view of solidarity on how we can work together in our research and in our practice. Um, so what is this then, punk ethnography? As I said, it, it comes out of, of uh, my own uh, collaboration with the school. It's, it's a method. So if you are a researcher, some, you don't have to be an official research, but if you're someone who wants to conduct a project and really wants to think about doing something different, punk ethnography can be a kind of method. To, to combine research with practice. And I'm not presenting this as a rigid model. I'm not presenting it as a solution. I'm presenting it as a kind of framework that you can explore um, as a researcher yourself or as someone who's interested in developing a new practice. So it's more a kind of framework to guide you, I would say. Um, what are you, what is, is there a requirement? I, I wouldn't say so. I don't think you need to be an educator. I think a punk mindset helps um, to, to make this happen. So that's one thing. And I think if you have a concern with social change, with why you're doing something and whether what you're doing is applicable to the context, to whatever your goal is, when you have an interest in alternative forms of being, um, you might have a concern with music, with, envir with environment, uh, culture, anything, then I think punk ethnography can be a kind of guiding practice that, that, that helps you to maybe contribute to a slightly different future, but doing it right here, right now. Um, so this, 
I hope that this presentation is kind of an invitation for you to think about a few things, to give me some feedback, but maybe also just to try it yourself. Um, so what is it? <laughs> or, or what's the framework about? How does it work? And this, again, comes out of my own um, research with the school. I, before I move into the nitty gritty stuff, um, I would say there are three big concept, concepts that, I, that underpin punk ethnography. Um, and I'm a bit too fast, actually. The first one is really very much rooted in anarchistic philosophy. So I read a lot about that. And I think the most obvious thing um, is that it's a bottom up approach. I'm not waiting for my university to tell me how to conduct my research. I'm not working towards an external goal that someone has told me to work on. It's a bottom up approach and the project's kind of growing as we go. And that comes with a commitment to, to govern ourselves. And for a lot of people, that means, oh, if there is no leader or no authority, um, it must be utter chaos. Well, no, I would say on the contrary, I think because you govern yourself and because you start from your own, um, your own leadership, you have to think harder about why you're doing things, what your, what your duties and your responsibilities and your goals are. It also means that whatever you're doing results in direct action. I, my research project is not about some, some kind of output that will eventually um, emerge from my, from my dissertation in say three years time or two years time. I try to engage in actions immediately with the school right here right now every time we meet and that's very often. And um, so, so that's, that's the anarchistic underpinning I would say. I think the second, uh, uh, Co uh, yeah, underpinning is, is about boundary crossing. And that's one of the reasons why I'm presenting here today. This is not an education conference, uh, which is really good. Um, uh, I think the whole idea of working interdisciplinary beyond institutions, beyond fields, beyond the research practice divide, I think is really necessary. I hear a lot of people talking about interdisciplinary work and connecting with other fields, but very often it remains, um, um, you know, it, it stays um, words, but there's not much action happening. So it's a very interdisciplinary approach. And obviously there's the word ethnography. Now I'm not an ethnographer. I wouldn't call myself an ethnographer, um, but when I first went into the school, I did use a lot of ethnographic te techniques. So I journal, I have conversations with people, I observe, I make field notes, I interview, but I, it, it was never really very, methodological so it kind of and and as i went through my own research the people who i worked with kind of became researchers and i became a teacher and we were kind of constantly switching roles so it was really hard to to claim that i was doing an ethnography but i used some of those techniques so that's why i'm saying well it kind of evolved from a methodology to shaping practices where we were all engaging in this project, but taking on different roles at different times. And that through the journaling, through the observations, those ethnographic techniques, we actually did things. So that's why I still use the word ethnography, but I've added the punk element because I'm not an ethnographer and I will also not position myself as such. And I don't think you need to have any direct connection with ethnography to do that. but be aware of the, the ethnographic element in terms of how you work with people. It's a lot about journaling and observing and conver uh, converse, uh, having conversations and so on. Um, so what, what do you then do? How do you organize your work? Because that's kind of what I would say this is. So then what I'm presenting here, I've got five minutes, should work, is how can you organize your work if you're in a project? And that's again where there are like, I like Three, I like the, the idea of having things organized in three parts. You are organized as an anarcho syndicate. There's a bit of a punk ethos, which I think is quite obvious to, to most of us because we're in a punk scholars conference. And there's the idea of working post-disciplinary. So anarcho syndicate means, well, you, you don't really want to be guided by an external bureaucracy that tells you what to do things. Yes, I'm a PhD candidate. So my university obviously asks things of me, but I justify a lot of what I do um, myself. 
So I'm not really, I'm not really, I'm not here to comply with things that the university asks of me, nor is the school very much um, concerned with external bureaucracies. It also means we're small by intention. I deliberately work with a small school. And I think if, you, if you're interested in doing large scale things, this would become a lot harder. Because if you have a large scale approach, you kind of need maybe a little bit more hierarchy. There might be elements that become more challenging. So we're small by intention. And again, that's the anarchistic um, elements. We, are, we govern ourselves. So we, we really establish what are our principles, what are our duties, what are our responsibilities towards one another. The punk ethos, I think I don't have to say too much about that. So it's do it yourself. We are committed to a project, but we're kind of crafting as we go. We are, and that's what I like about the whole punk idea is we're kind of switching roles um, as researchers and practitioners. Sometimes I teach in the school, sometimes they contribute to my research. We write together. So we're doing this role switch thing, what I really like. And we have a desire to supersede the status quo. We're, we're, we're not satisfied with the way schooling happens and the way research happens. And we're trying to do something about that right here right now through our project. And the last um, aspect is, is a very popular one in education, right? Uh, a lot of, a lot of um, schools and school systems today still work in a subject-based approach, but more and more systems are talking about being interdisciplinary. In universities, you hear about interdisciplinary work, but again, I mean, having a, an education scholar speaking at a punk conference, for example, I don't think it happens very often. I don't have a background in punk. So I think I'm kind of trying to make a statement also by presenting here and sharing my slides with everyone and sharing also the paper that I wrote, because I think we need, I also, I need to learn a little bit to, to be able to learn something else. So I'm making a, a, a case for hybridization and this is very much what I do with the school as well. So we draw on various fields to, to change the school practice and change research practice. And we see what we do as a radical action. We're not going to wait for a, a, a government or a, or a transnational organization to change education. We are trying to do something ourselves for the communities we work with. Um, so those, I, that, it, that is in a very, very, um, in a nutshell, uh, explain to you what it is. I think if you're interested, I have a paper that I'm very happy to share where I also describe and, and illustrate how I do this with the school. Um, so basically, this is this is a twenty minute invita invitation to for you to maybe think about. All right, could I? Does this help uh, for me as a guiding practice for a project that I would do? Um, could I? Could this be applicable beyond education? So it's an invitation to actually take it somewhere. Um, and I like this. I found it somewhere at a conference, and not very punky conference. I attended last year or two years ago. Uh, it might just be an interesting uh, approach for you to disrupt something, to create something, to um, I don't know, to do something different with the communities you work with. That's kind of the invitation. Um, I do like to end with a quote. Um, I'm a big fan of Ursula Le Guin. Who was, a, who was, because she died a few years ago, a speculative um, fiction writer. Um, and she wrote a really good book. That's the book recommendation I'd like to give the dispossessed. And these are the words by one of the main characters who's, who's uh, speeching to um, um, uh, the people of an anarchistic uh, planet. And he, say, he says, you can't buy the revolution, you can't make it, you can only be the revolution. And I think that's kind of, that summarizes what we're trying to do um, with our research project and with our punk ethnographic approach. Um, here are my contact details. You can scan the QR code to get the slides, but I'm happy to, just, I'll put the link in the, in the chat. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and I'm very happy to have conversations with people who, who think there's something in this, who want to um, talk more after this, um, um, after this presentation. Um, and I'm really happy to yeah, chat over Zoom and have virtual coffees. Um, a few references there as well. Um, and that's it for me. And I think that's 20 minutes. There we go. All right. 
I'm not sure um, how to proceed. Should we have the two presentations back to back or should we do a bit of Q&A uh, on punk ethnography first before we move to um, Anwar? I don't know, um, Q&A first. Good. I'm eyes and ears for anyone who has a question. <laughs> Are there any questions, thoughts? You can also just say that it doesn't make any sense. And really, I can handle that too. <laughs> what sort of school is you, are you working with? Sorry, can you repeat that? <clears throat> What's the school that you're working with? Is it a high school? Is it primary yeah. school? What is it? Good question. It's uh, it's an international school, a secondary school, but a really small one and quite an unusual one within the Hong Kong context. There's a huge international school scene here, quite competitive, um, and they are they are. I would say. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. Got a bit of an echo. Yeah. So they are. They are. They got 400 pupils, um, they run the school-based curriculum as well as a, two a transnational curricula, um, but they've got a lot of deviant school-based stuff going on. But yeah, so it's a small international secondary school in the far north of Hong Kong um, who are known for doing something different. So again, I think the question is relevant because I, I mean, I work with a lot of schools through through my job at the Education University. And if I were to go into a, a very large school that is quite traditional, I think that would be challenging given the kind of approach and the kind of underpinning ideas um, here. Mm. And I guess a lot of the international schools are tied to international curricula. So yeah, they're limited in what they can do. Yeah, but these the school as well. So they have a school based curriculum in lower years, and then they run the IGCSE. So the you know that's kind of based on the British curriculum and the IBDP, the diploma program in in higher secondary. And yet, and I think that's also interesting. And yet, they do so much. They do a lot of different stuff. So it kind of shows you that it's not an excuse to be you know, to run a transnational or a national curriculum. Um, and that, that you say, oh, we're tired, there's nothing we can do. I think the beauty of the school is that they, I mean, that there's, I, I can give a lot of critique as well, but I think one of the strong points is that they show, hey, we run a few of these established curricula, but at the same time, we also do deviant stuff and it's possible. <clears throat> yeah, I won't, this is the last thing I'll say. <laughs> um, when you were talking, I was thinking it would be interesting to think about education reform uh, in regards to, like, the climate crisis, I guess, since a lot of the kids, the teenagers these days, uh, you know, very aware of their position in the world with regards to that and probably looking for more interdisciplinary stuff that um, addresses it. Yeah, so, so your point is that, that a particular focus on, on environment and climate would be very useful. Well, I mean, the, 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 the subject-based or the, yeah, the subject-based sort of curricula doesn't really address contemporary no. problems, right? <laughs> no, and that's, again, but I, I mean, if you want to talk about that, we can. The focus of my research in the school is a post-disciplinary curriculum that they have set up. So they have mm. developed their own curriculum, which I call it post-disciplinary because it's beyond disciplines. And they're big around, they big about the outdoors because of where they are. They're in a beautiful part of Hong Kong, very green, very lush. So it, it kind of addresses what you're saying. And that's where, so my actual focus uh, and the project we're working on is further developing this curriculum that they have um, set up and I'm happy to share um, the link to you know what, what it, the outline of it because they're they're sharing everything as well as they're not sitting on it which is really nice and it addresses a lot a lot of the um, yeah environment related issues and as a human being how you position yourself within the environment mm. and what your responsibilities are
Any other questions? Uh, I want to ask you something. Yeah. yeah. Who's speaking? Uh, my name is Ayu. Hi, Ayu. I'm learning biology education. Uh, your presentation about fong, uh, punk ethnography is really interesting for me because Indonesia has a lot of local <laughs> to use as resource for running. So if me and my student have that punk mindset and to be non-government, direct action and for solidarity, and then our research is doing great. How if the government asking us to collaborate, is it still punk ethnography? That's a good question, right? Because I mean, ultimately, I also don't work as an as a complete outsider on my own. I, I work, you know, I do my PhD at a very big institution in London. So, so you know, I kind of have to um, address what they will want from me. I work as a lecturer in, in a in a government funded university in Hong Kong. So, I am not. I am not free from all of that. And the same for you, if you were to work with the government, with a, with a research body uh, or a funding body or you know, an external authority, I think it's possible, but I think you, you'd probably, and that's what I feel I'm doing a lot, is justifying why I'm doing what I'm doing and why it's different. But I think if you have good reasons um, and if you can justify why you think this makes more sense, I think I'm not saying you're going to win or they're going to say, go ahead and everything is fine, but I think it helps. And that's why the, the question why you're doing something is really important. If you want to do something different, fine. But just doing something different for the sake of being different, I think is not strong enough. And, and your, your government or university would say, well, why don't you just do what you know what a normal research methodology asks you to do i think if you can then justify why this is helpful for you why it helps you to move away from i don't know um established methods that you think are less interesting i think it's helpful my my supervisors who are established um professors in a in an established university so far they've been very supportive because I, I take so much time in justifying why I think this works. And it's not easy because I am an early career researcher, as they say. So the first thing that someone asks you is, but what is your position? Are you a quantitative or a qualitative researcher? Are you a, and, I'm, and I refuse to answer that question. So it is challenging, but I do justify why I don't want to do that. So, so to, to sum up, I think you can, apply this and do this despite the fact that you're working with big authorities but you justify what you do a little bit more maybe than other people creative practice research yeah william i mean um yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good word actually that's maybe a little bit more um uh, um uh appealing than ethnography I, I i personally sometimes think this whole idea of ethnography might put people off because it kind of gives the idea oh i've got to do an ethnography and i'm not really i've tried to you know illustrate that i'm not really an ethnographer but i use a lot of those method techniques to to work with the people i work with so yeah creative practitioner could work in the land down under Okay, and so, okay, William, and so does that, sorry, I'm just reading from the chat. Um, William, would it, be, would it be similar to what I've just described? Uh, sorry, I, I quite a lot of your presentation because I was going to pick up my wife up, uh, from the station. Oh. But uh, I catch like the last part of your presentation and uh, it, is, it is quite similar. It's, it's about breaking, breaking, you know, the tip, rules of doing research and and teaching in, in education so 
from what I know, uh, in my department at RMIT, there have been quite a lot of uh, those kind of movements. So a lot, a lot more classes outside, a lot more classes uh, they are not, not specifically being structured as your typical university classes. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, so that there is more of a move or a more of a um, kind of bond between research and practice. That's really great. And I know, I know Russia, for example, um, does that too. I have a Russian colleague who told me that it's kind of a, a thing in Russia too. Um, there might be other places where that, where that um, happens as well. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's great. And I think that should happen a lot more. So what, what's your field, William? You said MIT. You were no, RMIT. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing research in the politics of Indonesian hip hop. So yeah. Yeah. I'm at the uh, last stage of my thesis. So I'm just writing up. Okay. Wow. Okay. You're, I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Someone asked uh, in the chat, Nabila, you asked me, um, do you think the punk's mindset can help people uh, who are concerned about social changes and other stuff? as a way to guide people yes that's that's kind of the point i'm trying to make my concern is with education but education is everything if you know if you wish right so my concern is with the environment um, mental health uh, inequalities um uh, uh, oppression so i i i i think nabila i would i would say that if you are concerned with social change, minor, you know, issues with minorities, gender discrimination, um, environment, anything that you think where change is needed. I think punk ethnography can be indeed a guiding practice for people to work with other people in their communities. Yeah, and I would hope that um, that that people take it on board and and try it for those purposes. Yeah. Laura, uh, you said, yeah, punk pedagogies. Yes, I'm reading a little bit into that. It's interesting. There's actually, there's more pu punk is not dead. <laughs> there's quite a lot of recent literature around punk pedagogies and, and punk in education. It's still, you know, it's a marginal thing, but there's literature out there. And I'm, yeah, Laura, I'm trying to work my way through that and get inspired. <laughs> I'm looking at the time. I think we can have maybe if there are still um, questions, um, I think. Um, uh, hi. Welcome. Hey, ris ris risky. Risky, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's, it's very interesting. But I do like, you know, um, um, kind of find this familiar in my field. I'm an ethnomusicologist. I'm, I'm studying ethnomusicology at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. And um, some of the things that you said, you know, in me method wise, similar like, you know, in, in ethnographic, ethnographic approach, such as, you know, like bottom up, you know, researchers have to be like on the field and like, you know, um, gathering voices from grassroots. And also I'm, I'm noting down what you said here. Like, you know, um, Solidarity, of course, like voicing, voicing interlocutors. Yeah, you need know, to be, you need know, to be. There, there's a, there's a tendency to be like you know, um, whether we whether we are voicing the people or it's themselves that are voicing. So there's an issue there as well. Um, for social change, yeah, there, there's some some you know aspects like. Um, um, feminism, you know, critical theories like feminism, gender, um, decolonization, um, voices from um, the global south, for example. So I kind of find that similar. So this is a um, um, playing devil advocate here. Like, yes, <laughs> so it's <laughs> it's more of ethnographic, but what's what's the what? Uh, how should I say it? Um, if you were to call it call this punk ethnography, so what, which punk element that you consider that are not within this discussion of ethnography? I'm trying to find that myself as well, but maybe you can like um, um, 
explain that to me? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's one I've, I've asked myself as well. So I'll try to summarize. I think the way it differs from the, let's say the average ethnography or even action research, right? Because there are also some traits of action research. Um, I think is there, there's no preset plan and we don't start from the idea that there's a problem we need to fix. And that ultimately at the end of the project, we will have a solution or an outcome. So there's no outcome, there's no working towards a particular solution. And also there's no me going in and playing a very clear researcher role. So, so I work with the school and I am sometimes teaching there. And sometimes they are kind of taking over the, the research part of it. So the, I think the role switching makes it quite different from what you would call a more traditional ethnography. That's one thing. And it's not, it's not like we, we just do things on a whim, right? It doesn't mean because we don't have a clear goal that we're just kind of randomly doing things, but we work through initiatives as we go. So for example, one of the things that um, we're currently trying to set up is a series of colloquia for teachers to get teachers to think outside of their own practice and uh, engage with some research literature that is interesting. Is this kind of part of the plan? Well, not really, because my main focus is curriculum, but then it became an idea we had and we just set it up. Um, so, so that would be my short answer to the question, how is it different? I, I think the role switching, the not working towards an outcome, not being a problem solver. I'm not going in and saying there's issues here, let's solve them. Um, that That's the short answer. But you're right how, Some ethnographers do that as well, but maybe less explicitly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's, there's a couple of people who said things in the chat. I can respond to that. I'm happy to also just share the paper. I put a, I'll, I'll upload the paper in the chat because it's there and it's a the conference proceeding. Um, I think unless there's a burning question, it would be a good idea to move on to um, Anwar's presentation. Um, so, Anwar, if you're ready to go, are you there? Hello. Hey. Okay. Hey. Thank you. The floor is yours. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Anwar Pavetti from Culture Study University of Indonesia. Uh, I am having interest in subculture. What? Yeah. Oh. Anwar, if you can work with a, with a headset or a mic, yeah, that would be very helpful. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's better, I think. Yeah. Okay. I will present my research about a uh, woman with a pang sin, uh, ambivalent in Indonesian subculture resistance movement. Uh, yeah, we're uh, talking about pang, but what is pang? We have been defined pang into uh, five points. Uh, Personal expression of uniqueness, movement that serve uh, social attitude, process of questioning, belief that this world is what we make of it, and thus the constant struggle against fear. And overall, uh, I agree that punk is the way human perceive uh, the world, which is actually related to natural trait that are as on genetical in every human being. 
and what is seen. I use uh, Martin Person and Strauss term about seen. He said, uh, seen is a space in the form of an arena in which it is not only a place for musical discourse to work in tune uh, with newspaper, building the production of social space. The social action carried by subject uh, give a meaning to spatial space. Okay, and then uh, Du Blanc said, the desire to live freely and get out of the standard of societal femininity employed a woman to join the punk community. Uh, because punk uh, over women to have the ability to express and accept the side of masculinity in themselves that are constrained uh, by the existence of community dominate or normative standard or what she called femininity game stereotype feminine uh, and journey uh, said top research that interview that punk is able to offer research to women for gender resistance and against the dominant gender norm and male dominant of the punk scene itself. And no, the question is how? Who is the ambivalence of woman position in punk scene and subculture resistance movement in Indonesia? Um, I use a literature review. What ambivalent is described as an ambiguous and contradic contradictory con condition, irony, but except uh, because of the pattern and habitation of a particular culture and uh, femininity game is feminine stereotype that dictate women's action to be in, uh, yoked to the gender status quo. Subculture is individual from in communities that are conservative or progressive, integrate into the community and interpret themselves against parent culture. And the masculinity itself does not exist, but is constructed, reproduced, and constant at the structural, interactional, and individual level. And I use a method. Uh, case study of women who are actively involved in the punk scene in Indonesia. I'm using the documentary Indonesian Kami Juga as primary data to see a picture of the condition of the punk scene in Indonesia during the film period. And was a literature study and in deep interview with punk scene activists. Okay. There is a woman in the punk subculture in Indonesia. The emergence of women in the punk scene, uh, in the punk scene coincided with the early generation punk in Jakarta. Dr. Ben Pangkat as the first female punk band. The role of women in the scene uh, documented is in the Yes Kajil movie is active in music, and making design, photographer, and touring DIY and organized gigs. Women have uh, difficulty finding fellow female friends in the scene and yeah, because female is rare in the scene in Indonesia and risk of experience sexual harassment in the mosque. You know, mosque, uh, or male, yeah, was uh, the woman decide, decide to get involved in the punk scene because they felt the punk had an ideology of equality that they would not get in the construction of society. And this is uh, ambivalent in the punk subculture resistance movement. Punk is considered an ideal alternative concept for a woman in the scene. However, this ideal has not been fully applied. In the punk scene, there are behavior that are less supportive in setting women to become more progressive. Women are part of a minority minority a woman work in the same uh, ones to be few a work in general not because of uh, work by women 
the majority seem to spread a bias toward the perfection of equality itself. And the ideology of Sinal Pang, who is faced with a patriarchal, uh, is formed by the founding of the old gender tradition, but they are also oppressed by male domination, so they are not as free as Mao Pang. Yep. Uh, let's celebrate, don't be quiet, uh, because uh, now the Pangsin has made a lot of progress regarding awareness of gender equality. Uh, the East Taiju film had destroyed the construction of masculinity, which is uh, the only emotion a man can express is anger, violence, the best way for men to prove their strength and power, not seeking mental health, but just because men have to be told perpetuate the culture of threat because it consider men identity to depend on their ability to dominate women and perpetuate the culture of uh, homophobia because masculinity is constructed in contrast to femininity. The third uh, culture of misogyny because like a man has the idea that men as woman idea are a negative trait and men are more powerful than women. And in conclusion, uh, to be in the punk scene is a way for punk women to free themselves from the coercion of the feminine standard of society and tend to be normative. And subculture punk, which is considered to see women as uh, equal in the scene, is still in is still in uh, filtered with value of toxic masculinity, sexist treatment, and even leads to harassment. However, on the other hand, uh, the scene still provide a free space for women uh, to express their opinion without any gender or education education uh, level restriction. Okay, uh, that's a presentation uh, for for me. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you, want, uh, if you have any question. Thanks, Anwar. You're well under time, so we have more than enough time for um, questions, indeed. Any questions for Anwar? I do have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, Anwar. Um, it's, um, your paper is really interesting. Um, so my question is, this is mostly because I'm sort of like a distant reader right now within the Indonesian punk scene. So um, my question is that during your research, so you, you said that there's the kind of like this, uh, I guess, a much better environment. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, a much better environment uh, for um, um, women in the Indonesian punk scene. So I'm just curious if you sort of notice also a kind of a, a, a sort of like a, a broader sort of um, a broader understanding about um, about uh, gender and also uh, sexual orientation. So th this is something that because uh, I've, I just read, I mean, recently, I read um, an article about this uh, LGBTQ punk sort of uh, uh, ban in Malaysia. And so I, I was just curious if you also see this, that kind of like uh, existence in, in the Indonesian punk scene and the, to, to sort of like 
uh, the, to sort of broaden the, the kind of notion about gender and also the, the kind of like um, maybe a kind of a non-binary identity in this case. LGBT in function in Indonesia. Uh, yeah, very rare uh, because I um, in the scene. I I I never met. Uh, never met, but. Some. Hello. Uh, yeah, I, I think some some people uh, join the community fund. Some people more gender. Oh, no, 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 no gender. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, it, I. LGBT for me is very rare because uh, in my uh, in my yeah yeah in 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 my culture uh, Indonesia culture uh, especially uh, in Bandung uh, because I I uh, interview in act, uh, act, yeah Bandung sin sin Bandung for my research and in Bandung I never uh, meet the LGBT yep. uh, but the community is yeah, support LGBT anti homophobia but in this I don't. Yeah, I, I never, I never meet. Why? Why I have never met LGBT fun in Bandung? In Sim Bandung. <laughs> interference coming from your side. Um, we have a lot of interference with the mic. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's better. So I don't know if you have more to add. Do you want to add something else or do you want to move to the next question? Yep. Uh, LGBT in Pangsin uh, in Indonesia, very rare. And in Bandung Sin, Bandung Community Pang, I never met uh LGBT in sin. So so you're saying it's 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 hard to reach them or there it's a very small scene or maybe both. <laughs> uh, yeah because in, in Indonesia LGBT still taboo and uh and 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 LGBT was very small scene, and they are not, uh, they are, they are not exposed to public. Uh, yes, so I, I think uh, that, that the uh, ambivalence again, because uh, our community saying. Uh, support LGBT anti-homophobia but in this scene I never met him. Okay. Thank All you right. Anwar. Anyone else a question? Oh yeah uh, 
I, I can explain uh, the view. I am interview uh, woman activist Pangsin in Bandung, and I, I she, she's uh, said to me. Yeah. Uh, this big big topic in Indonesian punk scene, especially Bandung, especially Bandung, uh, the big uh, issue, yeah, sexual harassment and uh, toxic masculinity, because. Is, uh, this is a, uh, one of the uh, victim in the hospital area. Um, this is a playing, this is playing, playing a band in the gigs and And someone just come to her and she say, uh, he say, sorry, he say, uh, do you want fuck? Uh, do you want fuck with me? And yeah, I mean this this is a function, but uh, sexual harassment. Yeah, uh, normally in, in the scene, it's very normally about, uh, he say, as he say, uh, in, in now, uh, especially in Bandung, Pang Sin, this, uh, yeah. Progress uh, because uh, people start awareness to gender equality and and about sexual harassment. And, yeah, they great to speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Progress. Good. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, I'll ask if there's anyone else with another question. Meanwhile, also, uh, I'm not sure how much time we've got left. <laughs> I didn't really check when we started. Um, I don't know if anyone has a non-punkish answer to that. Um, I think we still have time for questions, but I do, I do, I'm not sure when we're expected to go back to the main room. Any more questions for, um... ah, there's a question coming in for you, Anwar, uh, but it's sent to me. Um, so there's Andika. And, oh, she, she's got a very interesting question. So Andika's question is, how do you think, um, Oh, hang on, let me read this first. Okay. How, how do you think the punk scenes can be made into a better place for women and other minorities? So that's Andika's question for you. So what, what can be done for punk scenes to be a better place? Maybe a safer place? I don't know. Um, Andika, if you feel like you want to um, unmute, go ahead. But so the question is, how can the punk scene be made a better place for women and other minorities. I think uh, we must more aware and more care, more listen and more speak up. And their attention for women and let's uh, 
that's being a human because uh, I say uh, is Pang uh, actually relate to natural traits that are based on genetical in every human. I mean, uh, yeah, let's come to the form of humanity. Because woman is not an object, she's an LGBT too. And uh, from, 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 from the self, less awareness, more care. Because uh, Uh, I think because all uh, the solutions start uh, from you, from you ourselves. Okay, thanks, thanks, Anwar. Yeah. Any other any other questions? Uh, yes, actually, uh, uh, I'm currently writing up uh, one of my one of my chapters, and and I came across uh, this sort of materials uh, regarding the you know this this newer wave of of uh, underground and independent sinsters in Indonesia, where where people have started to realize, oh hey, um, at least in in the hip hop scene, yeah, uh, a lot of people have started to realize that we actually need to be better. Uh, if we want to participate in this this sort of scene, uh, I'm just wondering if within the hip, uh, the the punk scene itself, is there any sort of movement from its its bigger players, say, uh, any prominent uh, band members or any prominent bands starting to spread these these messages like, oh hey, it is not cool to do those sort of stuff. Is there anything like that uh, within the Indonesian punk scene by any chance? So, thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you. We, uh, yeah, yeah. I think we can start from the uh, our work. Yeah. I mean, like like uh, Middle End Beats Collective in Jogja. This uh, yeah organize uh, organize event about about uh, and toxic masculinity in the woman march and yeah and they have a workshop about the. Masculinity, sexual harassment, and more spread uh, lit, uh, literature about that. And yeah, the, 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 this film documentary, uh, in Sin Kami juga, that is a uh, great work because uh, after the film release, more, more people awareness about the feminists, about the sexual harassment, about toxic masculinity, about gender. And yeah, I think it's all. I think Anwar, if you if you have names of bands or collectives, it might be worth putting them in the chat for William because I think that was his question. So you've mentioned a few bands or names um so maybe put them in the chat it might be useful for um for william um great we've got 10 minutes about 10 minutes left for any other questions more questions if not, then I think we can go back to the main room, but we've got 10 more minutes to hang around. <laughs> so. Oh. 
Okay, well, I'll take the silence as no more questions. So then I suggest um, that we go back to the main room and um, um, yeah, and, and see each other there for the next part. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you Anwar for your um, presentation. Um, yeah, thank you all. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, William, there's some stuff coming in for you. There, there's, yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much to Mrs. Alkil for the presentation and thank you very much to Mr. Anmar for the presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please go back to the main room because we have another session that is the last quiz session. And also we will see the performances by the next victim and human animal and make sure to always relax. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you.